Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it's my really great pleasure um, to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Brett Piper. I, until recently, was the head of the School of Arts at WITS. I'm speaking to you from a sabbatical hideout somewhere in Johannesburg and really delighted in the centenary year of the university to be able to participate in this important uh, platform uh, as a series of webinars. So our guest today, Joanne Joseph, is a Witsi in many ways. She's uh, reported on WITS, she's um, uh, conducting research within WITS and she's graduated from WITS. And over the course of the webinar, we're going to be exploring many aspects of her experiences and perspectives. Um, and there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers uh, for people in the audience afterwards. Now, many of us know Joanne as a very well-respected and versatile uh, uh, radio and television broadcaster and anchor. She's uh, written bulletins uh, behind the desk. She's done in-depth research uh, on stories and she's covered some of the iconic events uh, in the history of our country. With a perspective uh, from today's uh, webinar, you may be interested to know that she also has a passion for training and education and she does corporate training work and she teaches presenting and script writing for broadcast media. So she holds a bachelor's degree in drama, film, and English, and her honors and master's degrees were in modern languages at WITS. Um, and it's really wonderful to see the connection between people who did a traditional humanities um, degree program and have applied that in so many uh, contexts in the world of media. And at the moment, she's working on a PhD that I'm sure is going to come through in the course of this discussion. So the interviewer this afternoon is my esteemed colleague, Professor Dilip Menon, who is the a professor of history in the Department of International Relations. And he's really going to be our guide um, as we get to know Joanne better. So um, Dilip, um, having mentioned your name, I see you've just fled uh, the screen. Great to see you returning. Um, I'm going to hand over to you and really excited to, uh, to, to hear what you and Joanne have to share with us. Thank you. Thanks, Brett, uh, and good afternoon, everyone who's gathered here, whose faces I cannot see, and I'm assuming there are multitudes gathered to listen to Joanne, who is one of the most well-known South African uh, radio personalities, and Brett has done a great introduction. I myself uh, encountered uh, Joanne when she registered for a PhD at WITS, and then I had to read a PhD proposal, and I was uh, exposed to yet another uh, side of Joanne's intellect, a uh, very sharp, keen historical and literary intellect. And so today we'll try and think about uh, the work that she's been doing, her reflections on South Africa, as also this novel that she's written recently, The Children of Sugarcane, an extraordinarily moving novel of indenture. And what we'll try and do is to get Joanne to speak about South Africa, speak about the novel, speak about her experience as a journalist, but uh, instead of beginning at the beginning, let me begin at the end, because at the very end of her novel, there's a wonderfully resonant line, which I think uh, uh, points to something that weighs on all our minds. And she says uh, at the end of the novel in an afterword, if we begin to think about indenture as part of our shared history and to explore how deeply stained we all are by our collective colonial past, perhaps you can begin to imagine a shared future. And there are ways in which every nation imagines itself free of these chains of prejudice, of history and so on. We all want to make a moonshot to a, a new place, to a utopia. So perhaps uh, we could begin, Joanne, by talking about some of these legacies that we struggle with and uh, some of which are seen as particular legacies to so the particular legacy of apartheid as well as a particular legacy of indenture, which seems to, in many minds, affect only the Indian, those of Indian origin in South Africa. These are all connected issues, aren't they? I, I agree that they are, uh, Professor Menon, because, of course, uh, you know, we're all products of the system of colonization. And, and first of all, I must actually just say thank you to the WITS team for inviting me today. Uh, you know, WITS is my, my alma mater, my home. It's delightful to be here and to be in conversation with such a fine mind uh, as yourself. But, but you're quite right. When, when we talk about the issue of colonization, I don't think we have fully explored 
or understood how deeply its tentacles are buried in all of us as products of colonization. Whether we look at, at people who are so deeply colonized that they are able to identify with the, the experience of the colonizer and say, uh, well, actually colonization was a good thing for South Africa, as we've heard politicians like Helen Ziller say in, in recent times, or, or whether we are people who carry the internalized burden of colonization, which is that we are essentially inferior. I think in one way or the other, we are all tainted by it. And it was something that I grappled with in the, in the title, Children of Sugarcane, because of course, I, I, you, you want a book for your, a name of your book, that a title for your book that, that will resonate widely, far more widely than with just the descendants of, of those who come from the indentured. But, uh, you, you know, the, the idea was that I would call it Children of Sugarcane because in one way or another, every player who, who was engaged in that exercise of bringing people to South Africa or, or, or arriving in South Africa to colonize and annex people and, and change their way of life so drastically and essentially turn South Africa, Port Natal and other areas into laboratories of experimentation, to quote the academics, um, you know, was engaged in this exercise of becoming a child of sugarcane. We are all children of that legacy. And of course, you know, apartheid was a reinforcement of that idea. Um, and we are, in my view, still struggling very much with the reality of that today, uh, where we, we are still longing for a clear kind of identity. We are, we are grappling with who we are, who we ought to be in this day and age, what colonization has done to us, uh, what remnants of it remain in our society today, um, how we can perhaps excise some of those at, at some point. Uh, but, but when we talk about decolonization, I always feel we haven't got to the heart of how badly we were hurt, how deeply we were wounded by the idea of colonization, by intergenerational trauma and, and all the other related traumas it's left us with. Thank you. And I do think you're right in saying that this nightmare of history weighs on us, whether we are brown, black or white, and there is that shared trauma that we need to address. And it's interesting that in all your work on radio and in the first book that you wrote, Drug Mule, 16 Years in a Thai Prison, you were actually trying to deal with this issue of the uh, sense of a loss of hope that followed the end of apartheid, the desire for easy money, consumerism and so on. And then now you move backwards in order to perhaps find solace or to resolve an issue that cannot be resolved in the present. One has to look back. Uh, but that's really what we were talking about right now. What I want to ask you really is, uh, what made you think about writing a novel, right? I mean, in the sense that as a journalist, you've been commenting on and writing about the great perception about what contemporary South Africa, and we all share uh, equal degrees of jubilation and despair at what we see around us. Does a novel allow you to do something else, right? As opposed to writing uh, about contemporary life? Is a novel a way of escaping from contemporary life? Is a novel a way of thinking more deeply about contemporary life? You know, so what made you uh, write this novel? And we'll discuss the details of the novel later, but I just, thought about these two writing experiments that you've done. So th thank you for that. I mean, I, I love that phrase, the nightmare of history, because we're, we're all haunted by it in the present every day um, as, as we, we continue to exist and thrive and strive in South Africa. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you my point of view in terms of being a, a member of the, the media in South Africa, being acting as a journalist in the last 25 years or so, um, essentially, in newsrooms, there, there is such pressure on a daily basis to keep up with the cycle of news. And in South Africa, it's almost a recycling of news because many of the, many of the, the subjects that we deal with on a daily basis are subjects that have been in the public domain for a number of years. Uh, we, we, so if, if we look at the period of post-democratic South Africa, yes, we may have new faces in terms of presidents and leaderships and, and, and factions within governing parties and so forth, but, but the bread and butter issues actually remain the same. And the difficult work of a journalist every day is presenting that in a way that looks new, 
in other words, news. Um, and, and it's really quite difficult to do that because you're also on a kind of treadmill. You're up against the clock current uh, constantly. Um, the news has to be current. Um, you, you are delivering what you hope is a product of quality in a very short space of time. And, and it's quite transitory in, in many ways. Uh, it serves that particular moment. Um, and in the next moment, it is no longer relevant. Um, and therein lies the trap of news, that, that you are, you, you find yourself in a kind of domain that becomes smaller and smaller. It shrinks you to a person who is only able to engage on a certain number of issues relevant to the news of the day. And there is very little room for depth. So there is very little time for analysis. There is very little opportunity to go back and revisit the roots of stories um, and find out how exactly many of the events that we're exploring, um, you know, where they have their origin and how they came to be and who the players were initially in those stories. And, and I've been wanting to break out of that for some time because I've, I've been finding it quite constricting. And, and of course, working on radio gave me a little bit more leeway in terms of, of what I could do with the stories. However, there is something that literature opens up to the world. And I think all of us who've, who've grappled with it over the years and, and had the privilege of being able to engage lead, uh, literature of, of one kind or, an, of, or another have found some measure of freedom in it because it suddenly opens up the vastness of the world to you um, and, and you are able to meet various different aspects of the world with, within the spines of the books in the library available to you, you know, and, and that, that is really where you have the space and the time to explore, to investigate, to go back and, and to question and, and interrogate in ways that, that you couldn't before um, because of the nature of the news cycle. And, and that was really the reason for, for the books. The books are, as you say, they, they do explore a different facet of, of my, myself and my interests, but they're almost an answer to that question of what came before. What do we need to know that matters in order to understand the present day, all the news and current affairs that we are, are currently consuming on a daily basis, what is the background we need to know about that information in order to build depth into our understanding? So I hope that answers your question, Dilip, about, about why I, I dabbled in these various areas to search for the answers that for me, I was not getting as a journalist in my daily diet of news and current affairs. I understand precisely what you're saying, because I think this is something that uh, we would all say, right, when we read the newspapers, watch the news, that there is a way in which there's the eternal recurrence of the same, whether it's ESCOM or crime or whatever it is. And we do uh, feel the need to break away from this routine that dominates our lives. And in one sense, the turn to history allows us to only say, what happened, whereas the turn to fiction allows us to imagine what could have happened. Right? And it uh, allows us to imagine alternatives. And I think there's something that there's a fine uh, balance that is there between uh, your reporting and your novel writing. And that's really what we shall uh, go into in greater detail. But one of the interesting things about uh, you know, this whole experience of indenture as of apartheid is the idea of uh, people who have lost their subjectivity, lost their agency, that there's somehow an oppressive system without any cracks. And we know that the historian Jacob Lamini has worked very hard to, against this kind of cliched understanding, speaking about black tourists in Kruger, speaking about the fact that there were blacks who were uh, turned and worked on the side of uh, white oppressors and apartheid and so on. So unsettling our views. And with regard to indenture too, there's this idea that these people were somehow, uh, you know, the poor uh, Indians in the 19th century, trapped by famine, trapped by caste, trapped by debt, and so on, that they were shanghaied into uh, a dream, you know, that they were press ganged and taken across. And the very idea that a lot of people might have gone because they wanted to, right? And this is something that is increasingly uh, becoming evident in the writings, historical writings of people like Gayutra Bahadur, who wrote Cooley Woman about her grandmother who went to British Guiana, Amitabh Ghosh's Ibis Trilogy, which speaks about the multiple motivations of people to leave. Right? And 
For me, what was important, and this is something that allows us to reflect on South Africa, is what was important to me is that the central character of your novel is a woman, a woman with a mind of her own, a woman who feels that her life cannot be contained by what she is born into, that she has to forge something else. And this is a perspective on indenture which is new and indeed, in some sense, inspiring that there were people who left in order to find new lives and to refashion themselves as human beings. And this also speaks in many ways to our contemporary situation here, where a lot of people feel trapped in structures that have not gone away. But there are many stories, and you know this more than I do as a journalist, that there are people who are inventing themselves, creating new lives, breaking free of an inheritance of the past and so on. So that's something that I wanted to ask you about, that this idea of indenture as a space within which people re remake themselves also allows us, I think, to imagine contemporary South Africa afresh and anew. I think that's quite important, and, and I must also talk about the role and the role of the uh, uh, your role and the role of of the committee that actually sat in on my PhD presentation, my seminar, in in sharpening this idea in my novel. Because of course, we we look at our country, we look look at this at, at the legacy of apartheid, and and of course the overwhelming. The overwhelming sentiment around apartheid is the oppression, is the subjugation, as it should rightly be. But I was introduced during that PhD seminar at WITS uh, to a very interesting text called The Mute Always Speak. Wow. And, and of course, Ndavi Singh Butsemeve is trying to essentially fashion the idea that even during times of oppression and difficulty, so even as we speak in our country right now, as people have lost employment, are struggling to make ends meet, are grappling with issues like gender-based violence and all the rest of them, they are still striving as human beings to find joy in their lives. And, and that is a kind of subversion that, uh, that, that occurs in many societies where there is an oppressive system, whether there is a conflict on the go. It will happen in Ukraine as it's unfolding right now. It, it has happened in the past in South Africa. And that is what I love about Jacob Lemini's writing is that you know in, in novels like Native Nostalgia, you've, you've got a sense of the people finding their joy, maintaining their humanity, asserting it and their identity, despite the fact that the oppressor seeks to stamp that out. The oppressor seeks to drain their lives of every last drop of happiness, of joy, of sense of self. And yet in their private intimate spaces, they, they work against this all the time. And there you have this, this private subversion of, of the, the larger macro political system uh, taking place. And, and the, the examples that Ndabi Singh Motseme gives, and one of the, the examples that always stays with me, is the kind of raids on the township at night, right, during apartheid. You would have the police come in, you would have them disrupt um, the, the entire sleeping township at night. You would have the children terrified at night um, and, and people would be taken away. And then in the morning, you would have a mother laying the table for her children, giving her children a good breakfast of, of what have you, and, and ensuring that some measure of stability is restored to their lives. And, and that, that small act is an act of subversion. That, that to me, that image stayed with me so strongly. Um, and, and it made me think very, very carefully about my characters in this book and what kind of agency I was going to allow them. Because it, it, it made me sharpen the idea that yes, people, people were in many ways victims of these oppressive systems of the past. In many ways, you could say people of today, pe people living in South Africa, are victims of the current socioeconomic system, but they still find ways of, of subverting it and asserting their identity and, and trying to strive to improve their lives, to ameliorate the, the lives of their children and, and their own lot in life. And, and so that became quite important to me, the notion of agency. I started to look at my characters of, this, of the past and say, yes, of course, uh, of course they were, they were sent, uh, they, they were, they were pressed uh, and oppressed by the system in which they found themselves. Of course, um, the, the system in India 
whether it was the political system brought about by the British or whether it was social systems, cultural systems that oppressed them were, were equally constricting for them. However, um, they, they had some agency. They, they, there was a certain amount of courage if they failed in coming to South Africa, if they died on the ships on the way here, if they committed suicide on the plantations here, um, even if they saw their way through to, to try to build a better life here. And, and, and some of the, the circumstances of that were extremely tragic. There is a kind of tragic heroism to it so, so that they do not exist without agency within the context in which they have all operated across time all the way through to today. Actually, but this you see, this is a contentious issue. So when you think about the issue of agency, what we see is that in different parts of the world, uh, whether it's in India, whether it's in uh, the US, and indeed here, the rise of forms of religion, right, as forms of agency, which are in some sense based upon animosity, based upon resentment, based upon a belief in an afterlife, certainly, but what it does is to create a space of separation in everyday life. So we have Hindu fundamentalism in India, we have Christian fundamentalism in the United States, and so on and so forth. So is, when you think about this question of religion in South Africa, I think uh, when we think about the period of apartheid, right, there is a way in which one could see that uh, you know, phenomena, uh, political phenomena like black consciousness were deeply rooted in the sense of black community. But on the other hand, when we look at the present, the idea of religion is also something that has become commercialized, you know, where your pastor is making money and, you know, the various things that happen. For me, what was interesting is in the novel, and I want you to reflect on both simultaneously, if possible. In the novel, Christianity does appear as the place of grace, right? I mean, there is a way in which religion offers a kind of solace, religion offers a kind of bulwark against the, uh, the terrible nature of everyday life. But if you look at contemporary life, there is a way in which religion is actually dis, uh, distracting people from the fact that their lives here need to be improved and they need to do it themselves, which go back to the, goes back to the question of agency that you raised. So could you reflect a bit on this? I mean, you're thinking about things like forms of religious hatred as well as forms of religion which are commercialized, and also your idea of religion in the novel, which is really quite pure, I would say, you know, where it is religion as we imagine it, it restores a sense of self. Uh, so, so Dilip, if I could start in the past, I mean, that, that uh, in my view, the, the, there's a, a contradiction in the novel, because on the one hand, yes, Christianity should be the place of grace, and in some ways it is. But on the other hand, it is also a bedfellow of colonization. And, and so the, the very people who help are the people who hurt as well. Um, and, and so they, they are forces to be trusted at times, but they are forces to be feared at the same time. And one of the characters actually says so to the protagonist, be, be very careful and be very afraid of them because you, you actually do not know, uh, you, you don't really have a sense of, of whether they are to be trusted or not. And you've got characters who straddle both of that. And, and for all intents and purposes, I mean, the, the British system of colonization has that strong element of Christianity in it, you know, that, that monotheistic view uh, of essentially our way or the highway. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, therefore, colonization is, is quite Christian in the way it is carried out in the world in the past. Um, and, and it's very interesting, you know, when you talk about agency as well, I, I have a friend who visited um, a, a church a few weeks ago. And, and it was an interesting exercise for him because he's a priest as well from an established church, but, but he visited an autonomous church. And it, it was an interesting exercise because um, it, it was housed in a very large warehouse uh, there, there, were, there were ushers all over the place. It was, it was conducted almost as something quite theatrical, a spe a spectacular, if you like. And, and there, were, there were hundreds of people present in, in what was this huge auditorium. 
And, uh, you know, at some stage, when he began to become very uncomfortable with the messages that were being shared by the, the religious figure in charge, and I'm specifically not calling him a priest because I have doubts as to, as to the credentials of many, many of the autonomous who are, who are operating in this domain, sorry to say. Um, but, but at the point when, when the messages were repeatedly about prosperity, you know, the prosperity gospel, tithing, um, you know, giving to the church so that you will get back. Um, he, he then decided, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave. And he got up to leave and a very large usher, the, who was more like a bouncer, sure. said to him, no, I'm, I'm afraid you won't be leaving uh, until an offering is taken. And, and he said, because he was with, accompanied by a female friend of his and who was completely outraged by this. And she said, who do you think you are? How dare you tell us we cannot leave? And, and the, the man's response was simply, we do not re leave. Nobody leaves until the offering is taken. And then it dawned on them that, that all the doors to the church were locked. People were essentially bound within that space until they parted with their hard earned cash. Um, I mean, this, this brings up, never mind the safety regulations, Ron, brings up all sorts of disturbing things about the commercialization of religion in this country. And he said when finally he was able to leave uh, and the doors were unlocked, uh, because those doors were also manned by security guards from a, a commercial security company, when, when he left, he, he made a note of the kind of vehicles that, that proliferated in the parking lot. And those were essentially all luxury vehicles. Now, if, if that gives you a sense of who is seeking this kind of thing, it is not just, I mean, we, we, very, ten, ten, we tend very much to paint this, this kind of prosperity gospel, for example, and I speak because I come from a Christian background, so I'm able to speak about this with a little bit of authority. But, but we, we look at, at people who have been misled um, by, by these autonomous people who call themselves pastors, bishops, and the like. And we say, well, these are, these are economically disadvantaged people. These are indigent people who've been taken advantage of. But here is an example of, of wealthy people who believe that in order to retain that wealth, there's a system in which they must engage. They must tithe so that there's some sort of benefit to them. And, and it really is that, that what appears to me to be that sort of generation of tenderpreneurs who are buying into this idea of commercialized religion in order to maintain the wealth that they have been able to accrue in this generation. So, you know, it, it worries me all the time and it angers me deeply. Every time I've had to do a story of this nature where I speak about a pastor or I speak to a pastor whom I felt feel has misled people, um, I, I want to turn to our CLRA, uh, which is the body that, uh, that is supposed to, to regulate religion in South Africa to some extent, as far as it, it, it is possible within, in a constitutional democracy, to say, what are you doing? Have you done enough? Why are you not ensuring that people are protected from this kind of thing? But on the other hand, many people choose it. And there we have the issue of agency once again. Right, and, and, and that, that's the kind of twist to the idea of agency. It's not probably the agency that we desire, and it's probably not the agency that we approve of, but, but then that's the landscape that we uh, live in. And I think uh, it's one of those things which I, as somebody who's not very religious, have uh, grappled hard because it's so difficult not to be cynical about something like this, but it obviously offers hope. It also, very interestingly, offers the idea of everything now, which is very part of our uh, neoliberal capitalist kind of setup. So it's not salvation at some distant date. It's now, you get it now. You pay up and you're given. Uh, so I think this is an interesting thing because I believe that this is actually connected also probably to the question, a larger question of the perception of injustice that is so strong in South Africa, right? Most people feel they are hard done by that they haven't got what they deserve, that things don't work, service delivery doesn't happen, the courts don't function, the police don't function, everybody you meet is telling you stories of a system that's gone wrong in which people don't get what they deserve and nothing that should happen happens. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me again, to go back to the novel, uh, is that the one of the finest set pieces in the novel is the uh, courtroom scenes at the end, 
where what you see is a systematic miscarrying of justice, right? And the courtroom is where you go to actually uh, get justice delivered, or at least the hope of some kind of restitution. And I wondered how much of contemporary South Africa also crept into your depiction of the courtroom as a site of rampant prejudice, ignorance, and injustice. Look, uh, you you saw, saw right through the plot at that point because, because it, it was something that I was dealing with uh, in my daily work at that time. Yeah. Um, and, and it had to do with the fact that I, I sit on the board of Women and Men Against Child Abuse. So, so I was looking at this very much from the view of, uh, for, through the lens of gender-based violence. Right. And essentially, you know, we, we, we as a team, uh, my radio team and I, because it, it was largely comprised of women, uh, we, we, we sat and had a look at the justice system, the current justice system in great detail. And we looked at rape in particular. Um, you know, it, I, I'd come across a case of, of a child who simply because of where he, was, where he was placed while he was waiting for his case to be heard, had seen his perpetrator walk past um, or the alleged perpetrator at that point and out of fear had run out of that room had run out into the street, had been knocked over by a car and was left brain damaged by that experience. And I mean, I, it was horrific. And, and, and the team and I poured over this for quite a number of weeks. And we said, you know, what we need to look at is the adversarial, the adversarial court system in this country. We need to look at the secondary victimization of, of rape survivors in this country and ask ourselves, is the system actually working for South Africa, for a country that experienced such, experiences such high rates of gender-based violence? And our answer to that was no, simply not. And so we, we invited the, the justice minister's spokesperson um, who, who came along, Crispin uh, is, is a really, really well-versed, very well-educated spokesperson, and therefore brings a level of depth to the conversation with him. And, and he was able to answer on behalf of the Justice Department, but we gathered for this round table, a number of gender-based violence organizations who are working to eradicate this, uh, this scourge and essentially uh, you know, find just small practical ways of tweaking the system so that survivors of, of this violence are not continually victimized through the process. Um, and, and they made it quite clear to us that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not possible to simply convert the system to a non-adversarial non system, to an inquisitorial system at this point. But it is possible to start making the small kind of changes that can help us one day work towards that. And some of those changes after that round table, by the way, were actually introduced by the, by the Justice Ministry. Kristen, Crispin Peely very dutifully took those suggestions back, which we put in writing, uh, getting a kind of amalgamated opinion from, from all the, the NGOs present or the NPOs present, and, and we were able to pass that information on, and he was able to use it as a basis to discuss this with Justice Minister Ronald Lamola, and they were able to make a few changes. I mean, one of those small changes is the fact that hopefully the child, if, if implemented correctly, the child or the survivor, even if that person is an adult, does not encounter the alleged perpetrator at any point until they're in the courtroom. At some, in some cases, they never do because the testimony is given in camera. Uh, you know, there, there are other suggestions that we've made, such as the, the fact that many, many magistrates and, and, and justices and judges in this country have not had gender-based violence training. Um, and I regret to say, this is something that I will never forget, but if you go back and reread the judgments of our former Chief Justice, Mokhueng Mokhueng, you will be beyond appalled at the kind of comments he made in some of his judgments involving child rape. I'm appalled when I think of them, and I'm ashamed that we had a Chief Justice who actually thought that, that there were degrees of rape and degrees in which you could injure a child. Um, and, and that should, should govern his, his findings on that particular issue. I laud him for his stance on corruption and, and certain other things, but, but I think in, in this particular area, I, I was utterly appalled by, by his, his stance. And, and it gives you a sense though, of the ignorance in the justice system when it comes to understanding gender-based violence and rape in particular. And I, I then in, in the writing of the book, went back and asked myself, how much has actually changed? 
I mean, is, is the system much like it was before? And of course, in the past, you had a jury system, and now you don't, and you have that veneer of justice being served when, when it isn't actually. Um, but that is the reality for rape survivors and many other people who have complaints of criminality committed against them in our courts today. We have a problem with the indigent in this country, with the, the disadvantaged being able to access the system of justice. And, and what I was trying to say as someone who works in contemporary South Africa as a journalist, but someone who's writing about the past is that, to quote Manzoni, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yes, that is quite true. And I think this question of the persistence of history, the persistence of certain kinds of attitude that while you worked hard in our respective countries in India to dismantle the structures of colonialism in South Africa to dismantle the structures of apartheid, uh, we have either ignored the question of dismantling the structures of patriarchy, or we have actually not acknowledged the question at all, right? I mean, there's, a, there's something that lies at the heart of much of the gender-based violence, as well as the fact that courts are not the place of justice that you would want them to be. And instead of the rule of law, we have the rule of impunity. And impunity is something that uh, structures a society. But I think, you know, one of the things that you do in the novel is, again, something that for me was very beautiful, that at the heart of the novel is the friendship between two women. Right? And that is really, the, that holds the novel together. It's about the connections that are forged in situations that are hopeless, in situations that are, in some sense, hugely, hugely flawed. And... Uh, when you think about this whole question of gender-based violence and what you're talking about, the need to create a certain kind of atmosphere you know, where we can think about forms of affinity, forms of community and so on, uh, I think that is probably uh, uh, an issue that we need to think about very strongly and feminism and other movements, queer movements have addressed these issues. But, you have to, uh, but one last question, because we, I mean, I could talk to you forever, uh, as we realized when we met coffee or met for coffee earlier. But I'll ask one last question and then I'll hand over to Heather because I'm sure uh, people, uh, you know, the 113 people here, there are probably 113 questions in the pipeline. You know, one last question that I wanted to raise was, you know, this whole idea that uh, inspired the world, inspired each of us after the end of apartheid or the rainbow nation, right? That we are a nation composed of many races that will live in harmony, acknowledge our different histories, acknowledge the past, acknowledge animosities, but we will work this out. And this is something that uh, seems to be fraying, and at the same time is something that we are all consciously working towards as well at the same time. So there's this uh, dialectic between uh, the two kinds of movements. And one of the most important things in your novel is the importance of connection across divides, across race, across religion, and so on. So again, you know, for me, when I read the novel, I was thinking all the time of contemporary South Africa, even though the novel moves from 19th century uh, colonial India to 19th century uh, colonial South Africa to the present and so on. Because at the end, and this is the question that I have for you, how do we revisit this idea of the rainbow nation in the light of the discussion that we've had? And then after that, we can hand over to Heather for the audience. Thanks, Dilip. So I, I as, a, as a 21st century woman, citizen of South Africa, African a journalist, um, I, I think rainbowism had its place in the time in which it was introduced. Um, and of course, there wasn't a formal introduction of that. It was our beloved Archbishop Dutu who, who sort of promoted the idea and acted as a kind of mascot for that idea. And, and I tend to think that, you know, we, we do need to look at the, at the germination of ideas and the, the, their context at the time. So perhaps that was something we needed as we transitioned into democracy at the time. Remember, the country was on the brink of a civil war that, that was, was avoided by our, our leaders wisdom really and and their 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 intonation to opt for negotiation as a means of moving forward rather than any other method um but i think in in 21st century south africa we've got to look at that and say is it still relevant and i think the the 
the consensus on it now, when we look at it, is that rainbowism doesn't serve us in that, in this time. We have been able to show that, you know, that there's a kind of idea around rainbowism that, that, that pays very little attention to the pain, the individual pain of people. And it, it also almost borders on colorblindness, which is a problem in a society like ours. The notion of someone saying, I'm colorblind. If you say that in a society like ours, it's a fairly flawed view of the world in the sense that you are not able to look at black people and acknowledge the, the, the pain, the hardship, the suffering of centuries um, that, that they carry with them, this burden that they, they carry with them like a, you know, a, a, an albatross around their necks for, and, and have done for, for centuries. So they, there's rainbowism, in my view, is an outdated idea. But, but there are perhaps other words, other lexicons and vocabularies for what we ought to be doing at this time. Um, I, I, for example, believe that, that we haven't penetrated each other's intimate spaces properly. And that has been one of the biggest problems in modern day South Africa, that we have failed to bring each other into our homes in a, in a very intimate way in which integration ought to happen in for, for a society to be properly cohesive. So, so you'd have these sorts of examples of, of children saying, oh, I have a host of friends of different colors, religions, backgrounds, socioeconomic groups at school. Um, and the parents being, oh, wonderful. You know, I, I love it that you hang out with Sipo and uh, David and, you know, all the rest of them at school. However, if you were to bring one of those boys home and want to marry him um, when, you know, when you're older and you're adults, it's, it, it's going to be a problem. Um, and I've seen many examples of this in, in my own age group, you know, contemporaries of mine have grappled with this. Their parents um, are living with the legacy of apartheid. And so, and, and it's happened both ways, Dilip. There, there are, from my community in particular, there are Indian people who've not been able to accept either African people or white people or colored people into their communities, you know, into their, their homes and into their families. Um, because that divide has not been broken. And it, in my view, is right. not good enough to simply just go to work with a host of people from different backgrounds every day and say, I have a diverse group of work friends. How comfortable are you to bring those, those friends into your home and, and share a part of your life with them uh, where, where you, you connect far more deeply and where, where the friendship is woven far more deeply? Uh, many people are not comfortable about doing that. And that is why the fear and the mythology about each other continues to exist in South Africa, which really worries me very deeply. So I'm, I'm hoping that as South Africans, we, because we, we're in so many areas, we, we're, we're getting in, back into these them and us camps. I'm seeing the politicians do it, particularly in regard to the growing xenophobia in our country. You know, you, you can have Julius Malema on, on, a, on a stand in a courtroom saying, there are no borders in Africa. But a couple of weeks before that, he was going to restaurants unlawfully and, 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 and demanding that other Africans be removed from their jobs so South Africans can take, the, can, can take those jobs. And, and for me, that kind of disconnect and the lack of critical thinking around it, where, where ordinary members of the electorate are not picking up that disconnect is a problem for me. Um, it's, it's also got to do with, with the way our media are reporting on it, that lack of analysis. But, but it says to me that so much work has got to be done in our society because I'm starting to feel that we're on a slippery slope again uh, to, to a time in our history where people were classified, um, were, were discriminated against based on fear, based on mythologies around them. And, and I think we've got to work very hard as a society to actively break those barriers down that are currently being built in many ways, uh, by our politicians to their advantage. Thank you so much, Joanne. And that was a really eloquent statement because when you think about the world around one, I mean, liberty and equality can be fought for, can be enshrined in constitution, but the hardest of it is to create fraternity, right? The third of that triad of ideas that you've had in the French Revolution. How do we live together? How do we connect with each other? And that's the dilemma that we face not only in South Africa, but indeed uh, over the world, you know, in India ruled by caste, in America ruled by race and so on. So, but thank you for those uh, deep and very, very th uh, reflect, uh, thoughtful reflections on the state of contemporary South Africa. 
into which I hope I artfully managed to bring in your novel, uh, <laughs> The Children of Sugarcane, which I loved uh, and I recommend it to everybody who's listening. So I hand it over to Heather. Uh, I think we are within time, only four minutes over time, not bad. So <laughs> Thank you, Dilip, that was wonderful. Thank you for your great questions. Good afternoon all. So we'll just dive right, uh, straight right into the questions. The first question that we have is from a Remo Benjamin. And he says, can the idea of rainbowism or something similar be used to create some sort of South African identity? Sure, that's a very good question, but I, I think it's an inadequate concept. I mean, perhaps on its most basic level, and perhaps, perhaps one wants to weave that into children's literature as a start uh, to, to understanding. The, the diversity, which I believe our children are not getting access to. But I think when we get beyond a certain level and we start to have more analytical conversations about that, I, I don't think rainbowism is an adequate concept anymore. Um, I think, uh, for example, um, I know of a school that is about to engage in a, in a kind of healing event that in, in which the, the, the administrators wash their hands of colonization. And, and for me, it was an interesting uh, concept to think about because people are, it, it says to me, people are now grappling with the past in a way they haven't before. It's a more honest, less euphemistic conversation. It talks about what actually happened in the past, who was hurt by it, who the perpetrators were, whether an apology is, is required and what the nature of that apology should be and what recompense must be made in order to change the society. So I think we've moved beyond rainbowism to that point where our conversations have got to be sharper, more specific, um, and, and where we've simply, we've got to bite the bullet. And, and whether, whether we're looking at religious institutions at the, as the platforms for these conversations, mediated conversations, I hope, that can be held in a very robust way, whether they are uh, educational institutions like universities, TVET colleges, schools, We've got to find the spaces in which to move beyond rainbowism and, and get to the heart of what happened to us and what we're still dealing with today. Okay, uh, we have a Paulina French who says, Joe, and you have written not only a masterpiece, but also an educational and eye-opening story that is a reflection of our history. Don't you think that our education of history in our schools needs to be overhauled even further than it has been to date? Paulina, thank you so much for that question. And uh, you hit the nail on the head because that is what the education department is busy with as we speak. They're looking at history in a far more varied way. They're revisiting it. They're looking for hidden histories as I understand it. They're trying to uncover aspects of history that we, we haven't fully explored properly and, and trying to, to actually put some flesh on those bones. But they're also looking at other interesting aspects of our history that we wouldn't consider uh, as the, the sort of normal conventional uh, topics that should come up within the history syllabus. They're talking about other sources of pride to us as Africans, like the cradle of humankind, for example. And, and uh, Wits University, this is a huge and proud project of yours, and so it should be. But, you know, paleoanthropological history is part of history, you know. Herstory, in terms of, of getting the, the voices of women out in the way we frame it, all of, these, all of these concepts need to be reworked in order to present our children with a syllabus that I think is far more representative of their experience. But, but it, must also, it must also give them, as, as children living in a post-colonial country, the opportunity to look at history as not some unalterable, unassailable set of facts, but, but as, a, as a subject about which they should be critically thinking, uh, they should be critically thinking about the, the composition of the subject, the presentation of the subject, what has been included and what has been omitted. And, and that, that exercise, I think, if we take it apart in order to put it together again, could be a very, very useful exercise for our education system. So I'm very excited about what the education department is doing in that regard right now. Okay, uh, Anonymous says, has coloni colonization been replaced by tribalism? Well, um, look, I'm not an expert in that field, so it's very difficult for me to answer that question. I think colonization has been replaced by 
the kind of prejudice, or let's say has left its vestiges, right? Because we're not reinventing the wheel in terms of prejudice. Colonization has left us with enough of a legacy for us to know how to hate each other as a, as a matter of course. And tribalism, I think, is one of the ways in which it plays out. But racism is still with us. Uh, Gender-based violence and misogyny is still with us. Patriarchy is still with us. Um, religious intolerance and sectarianism is still with us. So uh, classism is still with us. So it is playing out intersectionally. I think colonization has left us such a vast legacy that we haven't even begun to unpack. And if we start looking at its individual threads and everything it brought, that still remains embedded in our society. I think we'll be shocked at the number of things that colonization still informs in our lives today. Okay, Betty Govenden says, who would be the arbiters of our courts and dare I say our churches and other institutions? Uh, this is a dear mentor of mine, Auntie Betty, to me, <laughs> because I've grown up in front of her and she's been quite influential in terms of the development of, of my novel and that sort of thing. But thank you very much for that question. I, I think it's, it's, it's a very tough question. Um, but, but if you are in charge of a church, if you are in charge of a mosque or a synagogue or an African traditional leader in terms of, 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 of a, a, any, any sort of religion, religious path, I think the the you are the you know you are required. It is incumbent upon you to find the tools to have these conversations. Um, certainly, the leaders of our universities, but the humanities departments in particular of our universities, are, are wonderful hotbeds uh, potentially for these sorts of conversations. University students or TVET students, you know, tertiary students in general, are, are, are woke enough to be having these conversations and they want these conversations to take place and they're looking for the safe spaces to do it. So it has to be not our politicians because I, I don't believe our politicians are in a position to be able to mediate these conversations right now. They're busy fighting their factional battles right now. They're busy fighting for power, for a larger share of the electorate and so forth. And, and, and essentially they, you know, they, they're engaged in the selfish work of, of staying in power or gaining power. So it really is up to us as a civil society to find the spaces. But I think the leaders in those spaces must be open enough to actually open them all up to everybody. So that is to say, churches cannot simply say, well, this is going to be a conversation within our church. Churches got to start saying, for example, let us have an ecumenical conversation about this. Let's bring other religious leaders in and, and people of various backgrounds and beliefs into this common space and see how we can find commonalities between us. So for me, that, that is really where the responsibility lies. And I don't think it has been fulfilled up to now. Okay, we have another anonymous question. Um, oh, it's actually from Peter Gonzalez. It's a bit of a long one, if you'll bear with me. He says, South Africa became a democracy in 1994. Now, 27 years later, we have the distinction of having the worst unemployment rate in the world, infrastructure that is on the verge of collapse, and a government whose only proficiency is extreme corruption. How do we help the electorate understand that their future is in their own hands and that they themselves have the power and responsibility to stand up and vote for the change that will improve the quality of their own lives? That's, that's a beautiful question, Peter. And it's something that I've been grappling with for the last few weeks. My husband, who's a politics major, also from Wits, <laughs> um, is, is, you know, and I sit and have these conversations at length because I, I worry about, I really value this constitutional democracy. And I worry about almost creating a parallel system to it because surely the, the ballot box is our means, is our conduit to, to choosing for ourselves the sorts of lives that we want. And he says to me, no, that's not the way democracy works. People choose their leaders and, and, and often in practice, their leaders do not choose correctly for, the, for their people. Uh, and that's what's happened in our country. But we're starting to see the rise of civil society. Um, I, I was looking at, at something that Sungye Zozibi has been has started up. I'm listening to on the periphery to a lot of conversations from people who were formerly involved in the liberation struggle and have become disillusioned with the governing party, who, who are slowly starting up in pockets saying, what can we do? And this is not to create a parallel governance system, but it is to say, you know, we have given our politicians too much power. 
And, and what we need to do is as citizens who know better what we want for ourselves, we should be able to found organizations or gather in constructive ways that help us achieve what we need to in the society. If, for example, the, the, the poor in the country are not served by the system, if they are the most neglected by the system, we have to find ways to ensure that we as civil society step in and, and fill that gap. I mean, there are some people who've been doing it for years. I think, for example, of Gift of the Givers, run by Dr. Imtia Suleiman. And, and in a way, he's got a parallel system running there. You know, government goes into the Eastern Cape, into Makanda, it dr drills for boreholes, and it doesn't find any water over a period of three weeks, whatever the case may be. And, and he arrives uh, there in, in Makanda, and he drills for boreholes, and on the same day, finds aquifers immediately. I mean, how is it even possible? But he is, is an example of a South African working in civil society who has, has served the need of the people, who is driven by altruism and, and wants to serve the people in the way that our government should be. And I think that that is an example to emulate in my view. It's not easy. He gave up a career in order to be able to do that. But even in our own small ways, even if we are beginning with our domestic cleaners, our helpers and our employees in our, in our workspaces or in our homes. And we say, okay, I'm gonna take on this little project of helping my domestic worker's child to learn to read, or I'm gonna try and get them up to speed because they're not that great at maths or they're falling behind at school. You know, I think these small interventions that we start with can turn into much larger, larger interventions in society. So, so there are the smaller efforts and then there is the larger effort where we gather the civil society and we say, we're gonna take this in hand and we're going to try to do what our government is doing. And I think business has a role to play in that. Um, whether they'd like to, like to or not, but we need we need those funds in order to help make the country a little bit more functional. Okay, uh, we also have another question here. What was the highlight of the twenty years you spent as a media personality, and some of your lowest points? Um, some of my lowest points were were the highlights of my career. Um, I'm thinking of two interviews, and, and it's because the, the issue of rape and gender-based violence is, is very, very dear to my heart. And it's something that I so desperately want us to solve in this country. But I'll give you two examples. There were two deeply hurtful and yet moving and illuminating interviews that I did with two individuals. Um, one was William Sekhodisho, who was, as a, as a boy, um, abused by a Catholic priest in South Africa. He was an Irish priest. The man then returned to, to Britain with impunity, has grown old in, in, his, uh, in his octogenarian years in comfort, never facing up to what he did to William. And William finally found the courage to come out and talk about this and broke the story on my show. And we did a very deeply emotional interview. It was very moving and very hurtful, but he actually received justice as a result of that. And, and he received a confession from the priest that he had indeed raped William as a boy. And, and this burden that William was carrying for so many decades in this late disclosure case was finally solved. And he's picked, he's picked himself up, he's moved on with his life, happily married lots of children and, and runs a number of successful businesses now in Bulukwane. And, and then there was Terry Oakley Smith, who is a very well-known diversity expert in South Africa and, and is doing wonderful work to stamp out racism as she has been for over 20 years in this country. Um, and, and she revealed to me on air her very sad story of how she was dragged into a bush at Zoo Lake in broad daylight and raped by a very young man. And she was, she, you know, she was devastated by this experience and it took her a while to speak out, but she made that brave decision to speak out. And, and she came out on air full of courage, still full of pain, uh, partly full of fear, but, but still that amazing courage of speaking out so that other people who have suffered this crime uh, can actually get past it in some way and, and speak out if, if that is what will bring them peace. So those, those really, uh, on the one hand, were, they were painful, painful moments to watch on air, painful moments to be a part of when you see how people are sharing their, that moment with you in which they lost so much that they will never get back. But at the same time, extremely uplifting 
because you see their courage. You, you are able to witness how a human being who has been so devastated and had almost everything, every shred of dignity taken away from them is able to build themselves up again. And it's a wonderful example to you of what you could strive for in your life and, and how you can help other people around you and use the media as a means to be able to highlight these stories and assist people who've had a similar experience. So those were both the, the lowlights in some ways, but also the highlights of my career. I find it very interesting, fascinating, actually, that uh, both your highest and your lowest uh, points in your, in your career are uh, both instances where you know you've seen um, personal it's it's a matter of personal people that you've um, been able to help or witnessed you know events that happened to them it's not even about you know when we covered Mandela's um, you know coming out of prison or the funeral or you know anything to do with the you know the more known personalities that we see in the media it's very fascinating that it's actually individuals whose life lives have been touched one way or the other were what made up your highest and your lowest points but that brings us to the top of the hour. And uh, unfortunately, we do have to close the event. I just want to say thank you so much to Joanne Joseph for taking the time out to do this with us today. It's been absolutely fascinating hearing your point of view um, on you know, topical things that are happening, happening in our society today. To Professors uh, Menon and Piper, thank you for the time that you have taken as well and, and your contributions to making today's event such a success. Last but definitely not least, I want to thank everybody as well who was able to attend. I think at the highest point, we had uh, close to 120 people watching um, the event as well as other people watching on YouTube, streaming on YouTube. So thank you all so much. It's always a pleasure for us to reconnect with our alumni as we have not been able to do in a while now. So thank you so much. And this brings us to the end of our event. We look forward to seeing you all again next month. Thank you and good evening. Thank, thank you, you. Heather. Bye-bye.